it, this, it, this piece was, in a sense, Eli's bar mitzvah. <laughs> but much as Yitzhak Rabin's 1995 funeral was called Bill Clinton's bar mitzvah, he was coached in Hebrew by uh, his national security advisor, my cousin Sandy Berger. So the timing of the premiere, April 16, 1967, was very unfortunate, however. Twelve days after Dr. King's Riverside speech denouncing the Vietnam War, suddenly Dr. King became persona non grata in many circles. The American Legion threatened to picket the temple in Long Beach if, if Dr. King showed up. Senators Jacob Javits and Robert Kennedy quickly declined invitations. Jackie Robinson, Ossie Davis, Ruby Dee were there, as was I with my parents, but the major press stayed away. And as I wrote in my bibliography of Ellie Siegmeister, it appeared in 2010, the cantata really only came into its own on January 15, 1989, Dr. King's 60th birthday and Ellie's 80th, when Bill Warfield repeated his performance, this time under my direction, with my Metropolitan Philharmonic Chorus at the Harlem School of the Arts. That's the performance that I just played part of you on video. You might have recognized Helene at the far right. I think also. So I have a photo of Ellie and Bill Warfield with me backstage, which is in that, that book. Ellie was intensely interested in the interaction of Jews and African Americans, and he wanted very much to make Bernard Malamuth's short story, Angel Levine, which deals with the interaction between Jews and blacks, into an opera. But his colleague, Mark Blitzstein, got there first. In 1945, this photo, which is also in my book, appeared in Musical America. Ellie had it on his piano, reminding him of a time in U.S. history before the Cold War when Americans and Russians were allies and our leading musical lights included those in the photo. Aaron Copeland, Ellie, Leonard Bernstein, and Mark Woodstein. Wittstein was actually interested not just in Angel Levine, but in a couple of other stories as well by Bernard Malibut, which he envisioned as a set to be called Tales of Malibut, like Tales of Hoffman. Not like Washington Irving's Tales of the Alhambra, which my editors were apparently thinking of when they miswrote on the contents page of my Wittstein bio bi bi bibliography, Tales of the Malibut. Hmm. <laughs> Malibut is, of course, approximately the same word in in Hebrew as Lehrman is in Yiddish, right? Malamud. So that's kind of funny. Uh, at, at that, all, all their lives, Blitzstein and Siegmeister had championed downtrodden ethnic groups, the Scottsboro Boys, Poles, Greeks, Irish, Italian anarchists. But in the early 1960s, they discovered their own Jewish identity for the first time as a source of inspiration. Malamud sold Angel Levine to the movies. The film with Harry Belafonte and Zero Mostel was not a great success, but it's still worth watching. And Blitzstein decided that Two other tales could make a full evening, Idiots First and Magic Barrel. Unfortunately, he died in 19, January 1964 without completing either of them. <coughs> but on the, suggestion, oh, yeah. is it, yeah. on the suggestion of Ellie Siegmeister, with Leonard Bernstein's blessing, I completed and orchestrated Idiots First, along with 20 other Bernstein works. Now, here is the only video to date of the only extant song from The Magic Barrel. It's a song of the matchmaker's daughter, a prostitute, waiting at a lamppost for a date with a rabbinical student who's fallen in love with her. Erin Passmore sang it two years ago at the ha Halifax Summer Opera Workshop. You can follow the score in this book, the Mark Lipstein Songbook, Volume 1, page 100.